welcome to Dragon Ball Dissection in 2022. Now, that one blows my mind. I released the very first episode of Dragon Ball Dissection on January 24th, 2012, which is exactly 10 years ago today if you are watching this on its early premiere date for patrons. If you're watching this on its actual release, wow, I can't believe it's already the last day of January. But 10 years I've been working on this series. That's not even getting into how it's been almost 13 years since I started regularly putting out videos on my channel. But here we are at the 133rd installment of Dragon Ball Dissection, coming into the home stretch of the final arc of the original Dragon Ball series. Thanks so much for joining me on this 10th anniversary episode of Dragon Ball Dissection. When last we left off, Majin Buu had reverted to his new, original form and blew up the world without so much as a howdy-do. Due to the abruptness of said world blowing up, Goku was only able to grab Mr. Satan, Dende, and the puppy, leaving Gohan, Piccolo, Goten, and Trunks, and Tenshinhan and Chaozu, to die. I firmly maintain Goku did the best he could under the circumstances, and that's what makes the moment weigh so heavily on him. You know, for a few moments. At least the characters involved care about this. This isn't as bad as Boo killing most of the main cast off screen, but... This is Gohan. While he's never made it through all his terrifying adventures unscathed, he's always made it out alive. Killing him off is almost as big a deal as killing off Goku for the first time, but it still barely means anything. After every trauma he's endured, every challenge he has confronted head-on, this is how Gohan meets his end. Passed out in the grass. Not only is he unconscious, which is hardly a satisfying end, his own loss is vastly overshadowed by the unprecedented destruction of the Earth itself. I believe, for the ending Toriyama is ultimately going for, it's reasonable to scale the cast down in this manner. However, like so many other characters in this arc, this does not do justice to Gohan, especially given that it's the last moment of individual consequence he has in the entire series. Saved in his place is Mr. Satan, which is actually a huge improvement, and I mean that. Gohan's character has developed almost nowhere, but Mr. Satan still has a tantalizing thread to follow. Now that he has been whisked away to another planet and told he is surrounded by gods, he decides that nothing he has experienced is real. This is all a dream. The gods are not terribly impressed. It's hard not to sympathize with Vegeta rubbing Goku's nose in this when Mr. Satan literally jumps off a cliff. Escaping the Earth gives the characters a chance to figure out what their next move is. Dende reasons, at the very least, they can use the Namekian Dragon Balls to set things right. This is the first time the Elder Kaioshin realizes there are Dragon Balls on Earth, and he flips. He disagrees with the very idea of them and their ability to disrupt the natural rules of the universe. He even apparently told the Namekians to never use them outside of their own planet. Introducing this is a great idea. Over all these years, the Dragon Balls are used and misused, subject to contradictory and ever-changing rules. But, aside from God's reluctance to revive them after Piccolo, no one has ever suggested that maybe their very existence is actually bad. That's something I'd love to know more about. Unfortunately, the series never actually carries this... anywhere, really. The Elder Kaioshin will grumble about it on occasion, but he never serves as a significant impediment to the plans the heroes are going to carry out with the Dragon Balls. If anything, the only point to this outburst is to revive Goku's manipulation of the Elder God through sex, so Vegeta can chew him out for offering up Bluma. Fortunately, that is interrupted by the young Kaioshi noticing on the crystal ball that Boo is regenerating in space. He tosses Goku and Vegeta his Patara so they can once again combine into Vegito. Despite Goku's earlier insistence on using them, to the point he was willing to combine for life with Mr. Satan, despite freaking out when Vegeta destroyed his, despite finding himself cornered inside Boo without them, Goku decides, for no real reason, he doesn't want to use them anymore. I mean, he says that Boo's also by himself now, as in not combined with others, but that's such a flimsy excuse. It makes it sound like Goku only agreed to use the Patara the first time 
because he saw that Boo was absorbing people. Otherwise, he would never advocate for a move as underhanded and unsporting as combining multiple individuals into a stronger whole. Never! I feel I've had to say a variation on this so many times this arc I've run it into the ground, but obviously Toriyama realized there was another pair of Patara and had to come up with any reason, no matter how flimsy, to keep Goku and Vegeta from using them. As someone not head over heels with Vegito, I'm totally fine with not bringing him back. I'd rather see Goku and Vegeta work together rather than create this non-character to replace them. And Toriyama already had to stretch credulity to split Vegito apart once. I am totally on the side of not combining them again, but it needs a better reason for it than making Goku an idiot. Well, an inconsistent idiot. Maybe it's not a big deal. After all, as Goku says, they have plenty of time to formulate a strategy. It's not as if Majin Buu can just instantly come here, after all. Anyway, Majin Buu instantly comes there, having picked up teleportation by witnessing it. Well, don't you just look stupid now. Too bad Vegeta has a compulsion to crush any earring that makes its way to his hand, so no takebacks on that bad decision. But at least with their combined strength, they can muddle through. Or they can insist on one-on-one, -on -one because no one ever learns from their mistakes in this series. Goku wins the right to fight, which is okay with Vegeta because he wants to see Super Saiyan 3. Goku contradicts his own earlier assessment, now claiming that he could have taken out the fat Majin Buu with Super Saiyan 3. Vegeta is so disgusted by this inconsistency that he refuses to even listen to it. Before the final fight begins, the gods head off to another planet for safety. I guess it doesn't really matter where it is. But I do wonder where it is. Is it also in the Kaioshin realm? Is it just some random planet in the universe? Does anyone live there? It looks nice enough, if a bit indistinct. Well, I guess it's not important. At least everyone is safe and accounted for. Right, Mr. Satan? Mr. Satan? Uh-oh! Well, it seems there's nothing gods in Dragon Ball can't screw up. Yep, gods. You must have known this was coming, especially given how we just saw Dende regurgitate a confusing list of meaningless deities to Mr. Satan. Look at his face over here. This moment is supposed to demonstrate how clueless Mr. Satan is, but I can't help but side with him. Cue the god pile up because I have been waiting for this moment ever since the last Too Many Gods episode. In part 6, I got to explore that topic from the perspective of using gods as a lazy cop-out to justify stronger characters, as well as how awkwardly accommodating filler led to a huge influx of deities at the same time. But with the reveal of the final boo, the god roster is expanded again for the last time in the original series. And that allows me to explore this pugnaciously populated polytheistic pantheon once more. But first... Last month, I held a contest. I asked all of my patrons to come up with their best two-part title of how Bardock could next be ruined. You guys didn't disappoint. It took me a very long time to narrow it down to five finalists. And those finalists are... Chi-Chi's Maximum Mistake? Bardock is the Brilliant Father? By David Serrett. Oolong and Puar's new classmate Bardock? Fast Times at Southern Transformation Kindergarten? by Soul King Mike. The once brilliant scientist disgraced, Bardock's artificial moon research defunded, by Tristan McNatt. Bardock vs. Grandpa Gohan? A red-hot, all-out, fierce legal battle for the custody of Z-Warrior Son Goku, by Daniel Quinlan. And finally, rap battle for the universe's future. Bardock likes big butts and he cannot lie by Silby. And the winner, as chosen by patrons, is... Bardock vs. Grandpa Gohan? A red-hot, all-out, fierce legal battle for the custody of Z-Warrior Son Goku by Daniel Quinlan. Thanks so much, everyone who participated. I hope, Daniel, you are enjoying your copy of Akira Toriyama's Manga Theater. And now, the god rant you've all been waiting for. This is, in fact, the fifth time the Boo arc has expanded its god roster. The brief cameo by the Southern Kaio confirms that our Kaio isn't the only one, and implies the existence of others beyond these two. 
Piccolo meeting Kaioshin clarifies that this is the case, while simultaneously introducing two tiers above a Kaio, that of the Grand Kaio and the Kaioshin. Not long after, Kaioshin reveals that there were a total of five Kaioshin who fought against Boo, expanding his tier. Later, we are introduced to the idea of Kaioshin of generations past. Now, we learn that one of those five Kaioshin was actually a Grand Kaioshin, placing him above all the others. That's ten new gods and one divine attendant. Only three of them are important characters in this arc. Two of them have been combined into one person without any consequence, and the other has the exact same job. Why do we need these? What does a Kaioshin even do? What makes a Grand Kaioshin better? Why do they need to exist? The story does not tell us anything. When I made my last God episode, I had so many people tell me that I was looking at this from a monotheistic perspective, that other cultures like the ancient Greeks or Shinto have lots and lots of gods. Believe me, I was not forgetting that. I'm not trying to put an arbitrary cap on how many gods is an amount I have deemed acceptable, and that anything exceeding that is just too many. It's like the length of a story. A story is only too long if it doesn't have enough interesting content to justify its length. There are only too many gods if the story doesn't need that many. When I say Dragon Ball has too many gods, I don't necessarily literally mean the number is too high. I mean that the gods in Dragon Ball are functionally interchangeable, and that continuing to stack more of them compounds that problem. As a counterexample, I present a tale from a polytheistic tradition the story of Persephone from Greek mythology. Persephone is the daughter of Zeus and Demeter, the latter of whom is the goddess of the harvest and agriculture. Hades, the god of the underworld, falls in love with Persephone and abducts her to his realm. Demeter searches the earth for her daughter, and in her grief, nothing grows. Zeus sees the consequences of Hades' actions and forces him to return Persephone. However, Hades tricks Persephone into eating pomegranate seeds. Since she has tasted food from the underworld, she is forced to return every year. During that time, crops do not grow. In other words, this series of events creates winter. We see in this tale gods who are responsible for specific functions. They have interpersonal relationships with each other. Actions taken by one god can affect others. Those functions and relationships have tangible effects on the world they oversee. And most importantly, those ideas come together to tell an entertaining story. Now don't misunderstand me, Toriyama doesn't have to follow that specific model. He is not creating a religion, he's telling a story in a fantasy world he created. In this fantasy world, gods definitively exist as characters in the story. We don't need to know everything about them, but given their increasing importance, we do need to know enough to buy that they exist within their world. Dragon Ball's problem isn't too many gods per se, it's that they have poorly defined roles that don't justify their inclusion in the story. Dragon Ball's gods tend to serve two main functions. They warn of impending crisis, or they provide training and other types of power-ups. In fact, given that story function, Dragon Ball gods actually predate literal gods. Who we eventually come to know as Earth's god is really just an upgrade to Karin, who himself is just an upgrade to Kame Senin, whose design is based on the god character from Dr. Slump. Gods only come into the story because Goku has outgrown other types of enlightened masters. And since it's difficult to conceive of anything beyond a god, Toriyama settles for adding more and more layers of gods once the previous god has been surpassed. They are created to help Goku and the others, but rarely seem to have an in-universe justification for existing beyond that. They aren't unique to each other beyond possibly having increasingly larger areas of jurisdiction. The only clarification for their roles comes in guidebooks. As far as the story is concerned, they do the same things, only better than the ones who came before. Even that betterness is a rather nebulous quality. You just have to take our word for it that this one is better. Gods in Dragon Ball have always been ill-defined, but it's not until this arc that it really becomes a problem due to the introduction of the Kaioshin. Even with the pitifully brief expanding of the Kaio, there is a logical progression in how gods have been presented up to that point. In fact, I go so far as to say the addition of the other Kaio helps clarify what Kaio's nebulous role has been. We have a Kami, or god, who oversees a single planet. Then there are the four Kaio, each of whom oversees a quadrant of the universe. 
That is to say, each oversees many planets. Then there is the Grand Kaio, who has jurisdiction over all the quadrants. That is to say, he reigns over the entire universe. While it's still not clear what they do, the hierarchy at least is clear. It implies the existence of many direct overseers to relatively small sections of the cosmos, with increasingly fewer supervisors the broader the area gets. It's like how if you work in a chain store, you'll have many workers overseen by a store manager. A collection of store managers from various stores work under a district manager. A collection of district managers report to a regional manager, and so on and so forth. That makes sense. The system falls apart when you get to the Kaioshin, who, it turns out, are structured exactly the same as the Kaio. There are four of them, each named for a cardinal direction, and one grand variant who stands above them. That is completely redundant! At least for the brief time we were only aware of one Kaioshin, it wasn't entirely preposterous, especially since he's situated as a god for the gods. He is the god that they worship. But once we find out about the rest of them, it turns out they're exactly the same, with the exact same area of jurisdiction. Talk about micromanaging. There is literally a god for each individual god. That would be like if every worker in a store had their own manager. What is the point? All the Kaioshin should have just been the Grand Kaio. Oh wait, can't do that because he was already used in filler. Geez, the Kaioshin are just the Vegito of gods. Finally, I'm sure a lot of you are saying that that's the point. Toriyama's whole joke with the afterlife is to turn it into a bloated bureaucracy, with tons of redundant positions and positions filled by those who don't merit them. I wish I could say I buy into that, but I just can't. The conceit of the afterlife as populated by Japanese salarymen only goes as far as Inma and his employees. It's handled quite well there. It just doesn't seem to follow through anywhere else. Dragon Ball certainly isn't afraid to treat gods irreverently. It does that all the time, but not really in the context of a commentary against corporate culture. It's more in the sense that Dragon Ball as a whole is written with an irreverent sense of humor, and no one is above being mocked or lampooned. That's the whole joke with Kame Senin. He's a Senin, an enlightened hermit sage who has extended his natural lifespan, sequestered himself from humanity, and cut himself off from worldly pleasures and conveniences. Except that he lives in a comfortable house with modern technology and is addicted to pornography. The latter doesn't negate the former. He's still a powerful martial arts master. He is still wise and nurturing. Kaio is a fat box of dad jokes with a passion for driving nowhere, but there's never any indication that he doesn't adequately fulfill his function. Whatever it is. That's the joke, the juxtaposition of these opposing ideas. These gods aren't written to be useless. If they were, Toriyama wouldn't have to keep adding more to push the story along. They just get outclassed and used up. Even Enma, who carries the workplace joke, is never shown to be bad at his job. We never see him lose souls or rubber stamp judgments or send batches of innocent people to hell because he stubbed his toe or something. Okay, we did see something like that in the episode right before this, but that was just a movie. We see him take his job very seriously. He takes the proactive step of keeping Vegeta around because it might be better for the universe. In fact, of all of Dragon Ball's gods, Inma is the only one who is clearly defined. He is the judge of souls, determining what happens to people after they die. Boom! Simple. Despite having far fewer appearances than most other DB gods, we understand his responsibilities better than any of the others. That's probably solely because Toriyama didn't create him in the first place. Yes, in case you didn't know, Enma, more often known outside of Japan as Yama, is an established god in Buddhism and Hinduism. He's about as immediately recognizable to Japanese culture as the idea of seeing St. Peter at the Pearly Gates is to ours. In fact, Enma's mentioned in Dragon Ball's Demon Realm filler episode long before Toriyama introduces him into his series. That's not a case of Toei getting the jump on him. It's just that ubiquitous. Everyone knows who he is and what he does, so all Toriyama had to do was put a new coat of paint on him. When you put an established god alongside Toriyama's creations, it becomes achingly obvious how undercooked his are by comparison. Obviously, Dragon Ball couldn't end without making the problem worse, introducing designs for two new pointless gods. 
It is very fitting that they exist only to justify another character's transformation. Because that's what they always do. So, that is that. It's so satisfying to finally lay all of that out there. Remember, I've been waiting over a decade to say some of this stuff. Thank you for watching. The final fight kicks off when we return next time. Goku and Vegeta get some help from an unexpected source, concluding one of the best character arcs in the entire series. Granted, it's not quite as good as the character development of all these channel supporters you see here. Thanks. You're number one. All of you. You're tied for number one.